everybody. We're here with our friend Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil, I want to get to your book in just one second, but before we do, I got to touch on Pluto one more time. Don't with get you. me started. No, listen, listen. Well, there's some new scientists out there, some young bucks who are on the scene who say you and all the other people who said that Pluto should be taken out of the list of the of the nine principal planets that we grew up with, uh, that you guys are wrong because they're now saying that it's not is it large enough to clear out its neighborhood in orbit. It's that is it large enough that its gravity allows it to become spherical? I'm going to freak you out, Neil. <laughs> I'm on your side. I don't like this definition. Ooh. Yeah, I, spherical doesn't cut it. Then Ceres would be a planet. Ceres, it, the largest asteroid, would then be a planet, and so would a host of other things. And that's what they want. They want like 50 planets in the solar system. Mm -hmm. And then the word kind of has lost all. Distinction. Have you talked to point. these guys? Have you called yeah, them yeah, up and said, knock it off? He's not, he's not, I know, the, I know all the people in there, and they're not. Uh, for me, Pluto crosses they're the not, orbit. What get, what, get to the noun there. They're, <laughs> not, they're, Pluto, not, they're not, they're Pluto, not real. But the noun is fully implied. Um, that Pluto crosses the... Oh. Damn. For, for, Pluto. Damn. I've never heard a worse insult not stated. <laughs> Pluto crosses the orbit of Neptune. That's just embarrassing. You can't be a planet and crossing other planet orbits. We, comets do that. We got words and other categories for stuff like that. I'm not... Throw down, I'm man. Done. Throw down. Pluto right had now. it Throw coming. Down. <laughs> Pluto, Pluto... Our moon is five... Our moon is five times the mass of Pluto. Did you know that? Yes, because we've didn't. argued about this a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to tell you, 13 years in, I'm on your side now. I, this I, is new territory well, for me. Thanks for opening this is your a brave, eyes. This is a brave new world. This is where no man, this man has never gone before. Uh, welcome. So the book is called, as I said before, Accessory to War, The Unspoken Alliance Between Astrophysics and the Military. What is that? What, what is the unspoken alliance? Well, so uh, the traditional sciences like physics, chemistry, biology, it's not hard to imagine how they might have direct implications in warfare. You know, the physicist makes the bomb and the mm -hmm. chemist makes the chemicals, mm -hmm. like napalm and that yes, sort of yes. thing. And the, you might, uh, a rogue state might hire a biologist to, to weaponize anthrax. Mm -hmm. But the astrophysicist, we're like kind of not doing that. We're just sitting at not the top even of on a this mountain. Planet. But, <laughs> no, we sit there and wait for like photons of light to come to our detector. And then we take that to the coffee lounge and talk about it. So, so, so we're not normally associated with warfare, but uh, I came to this revelation about 13 years ago. We are so deeply in bed with the military, I can't even begin to tell you. And my, I, 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 my field is overwhelmingly sort of liberal anti-war. So we are simply complicit with this fact. So go all the way back. So if you wanted to rule the seas and all the lands that you came upon, you needed to know how to navigate. And the people who knew how to navigate back then, who understood the sun, moon, and stars, were the astronomers. And so you needed one of those wherever you were going. And not only that, you could use knowledge of the sky to be exploitive. For example, I got a Columbus story. Might I tell you real quick? Sure, of course. Christopher Columbus, his fourth voyage. He, he's on the island of Hispaniola. And he needs supplies to get back to, to Spain. And he doesn't have enough. So he goes to the natives and says, could you give us some of your supplies? And they only make exactly enough to get through to the next season. So they didn't have enough. Columbus says, I will summon divine forces. He knew that in a week hence, there was going to be a total lunar eclipse. I will summon, if you don't give me your supplies, I will summon divine forces and make the moon disappear from the night sky. And they're kind of skeptical, right? And so, but sure enough, a week goes by, the moon begins to disappear, and they freak. They give him all the supplies he wants. And he waits till mid-eclipse. Then he steps out of his cabin and says, My, our God is, will now be good to you because you did the right thing, and uh, we will let the moon come back. So the second half of the eclipse, the moon comes back, and he goes away. So if you needed yet another reason to think Columbus was a dick, that would do it. <laughs> okay? Wow. Okay. Oh, sorry. Wow. I have some Italian viewers. I have some Italian viewers. He's so lucky, he's really lucky it wasn't cloudy. <laughs> uh, or they would yeah, have died. Good, 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 very good point. Thank you. Very good point. Thank you. Uh, well, I, another quick one. Captain Cook uh, went to the South Pacific. Sure. Uh, and you look at his orders. It's, okay, there's a... Venus is going to pass between Earth and the Sun. Measure that with our telescopes that we're going to give you. So it's a scientific expedition, ostensibly. But then you flip it over and it's like, oh, while you're there, here's new navigation tools. Map every coastline you come to. Every coastline. And bring back the maps. 
So that's what he did. He measured the transit of Venus, fine, comes back, presents the maps. Within 18 years, Great Britain had taken control of Northern Australia, of New Zealand, of Tasmania, of Cook Islands, Pitcairn Islands, uh, Fiji, and Tuvalu. Every one of those because flags. The scientists provided the information the military needed. Yes, yes. And every one of those countries has the British flag as an inset in what would otherwise be their sovereign flag. What about our space program? Because our space program actually borrowed from. Do you cover that? That Operation Paperclip? What do you think? This is a 600 page book. Do I, don't I cover know. our space program? <laughs> tell me about. What, what? Tell the Operation Paperclip. I understand. I understand. I understand. I can't, okay. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> What? Tell the people about Operation Paperclip, about how we went and got the, 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 the German uh, scientists, Werner von Braun and his crowd, to come over here. The Soviets so took Werner half of them. Werner von Braun invents rockets, basically. The, v, the V2. The V2. Yeah, the, v, the, yeah the, the V1 was, a, was not... The buzz bomb. Yeah, the, and the V2 was the first ballistic missile that leaves our atmosphere, goes into the vacuum of space, and comes back and hits its target. Yeah. He knew, even though this is deputized for warfare, that after the war, if you're going to go into space, you're going to need something like that. We knew that, too. We didn't put him on the line at Nuremberg, okay? We kept him, all right? right? And, and the Russians stole the Ru other guys. Russians got their, their German scientists. We got ours. Yeah, the joke in the 1960s was, our German scientists are better than you. Right, exactly. Scientists. And so we got him to birth the Apollo program and design the rocket that would go to the moon. And so using his expertise that he used to terrorize London with the V2 rocket. This, mm -hmm. this relationship goes deep. And, it goes, it, and so I'm, I'm, I was conflicted because I grew up during the Vietnam War. And Vietnam was bad no matter how you slice that. Remember that line in the song, war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. That, that did, say it again. <laughs> that was good. That was good. <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> So that line wasn't Vietnam War. What is it good for? It was war. So my, Vietnam shaped what war is to me. But meanwhile, there are statues of proud soldiers standing there brandishing weapons and things. And, and I said, why would anyone build a statue if war is this bad? And then I realized the Vietnam War had that weight of, of, of moral uh, 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 turpitude. And other wars, no, no one felt that way about them. People were proud to fight in the Second World War, to, to, to rid Europe of, of fascism. And so I no longer pass judgment on whether something is invoked for war, recognizing that there are times when your security matters and there are bad agents operating, either domestically or internationally, and sometimes you'll need it. So I, had to, I matured into that view. And it, no, it's no longer the, oh, kumbaya, war, make love, not war. If someone is bad and they're coming at you, I'm making war, because I'm going to kick... <laughs> this is a whole new Neil Tyson, right there. <laughs> well, I cannot wait to read the book. Accessory to War is out today. The man is Neil deGrasse Tyson, everybody. We'll be right back with Michael Rappaport.